the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. John Chrysostom, or Chrysostom, depending on how you want to pronounce it, 4th century Antiochian, born of pagan parents, uh, was well-to-do, baptized at 21 or 22, depending on how you work the number, so a young adult, and was passionate in his Christian devotion. Through a lot of education, eventually came into what we would now call ordained ministry. He really became, began as a monk. But here's what he's noted for. Chrysostom, or Chrysostom, depending on how you pronounce the Greek term, means golden mouth. And it had everything to do with his preaching. His preaching was practical and expository in a way that was very, very different from some of his peers, which was far more allegorical and, in fact, kind of mystical. And it wasn't that Chrysostom was not mystical. In fact, he was known for his extraordinary devotion. He was a monk, after all, you see, and had spent a lot of years in, her in a hermitage. And he was known, in fact, for his really severe uh, devotional practices. But people flocked to his practical expository preaching. And out of that, he came to the attention of an empress, whom he would later ruefully call Jezebel, <laughs> who decided she wanted him as her court preacher. And one of the stories, we don't know whether this is actually true or not, was the fact that he had no interest in being elevated to bishop and therefore becoming her court. And he was kidnapped and literally taken away against his will. Well, she got more than she bargained for uh, because not only did he continue to speak plainly and expositionally about the scriptures, he, using that plain exposition, denounced the excessive riches, the ignorance of the poor and the needy, both on the part of the empress, which is where Jezebel came from, mm -hmm. but as well as his fellow clergy. Uh, it was his responsibility, for example, to host these extraordinarily lavish dinners. That's what they felt they were in due, meaning clergy and political figures, and he refused to do so because of their unwillingness to, in fact, serve those in need that they represented. Um, he eventually actually was put into exile uh, for all of his public denunciations and eventually died. Now, we have his sermons. I've got in my office the homilies on the Gospel of John and the other things for which he's known. And they are tough. I mean, if you read some of that stuff, he talks about taking the, what was one of the phrases, taking the uh, knife of the Holy Spirit to cut out of your life false desires that stand against you and God. He said, if you wrestle with things like lust and love, it has everything to do with an absence of resolution. Well, get over it, as it were, <laughs> we would say. Um, the lessons, I think, strike the kind of balance that was true for John between boldness and love. It would be very easy to take John's example and say, go get them, get out there and be bold. And it winds up becoming a use, uh, an excuse for us to say whatever's on our mind. Uh, we're not preachers and people or Christians are not supposed to be people who are known for saying whatever's on their mind regardless of the consequences of what you say in the life of other people. You and I know people like that who are always blunt to a fault. And that doesn't necessarily promote the gospel because in essence that's just my excuse to say whatever I think. think. It's very self-absorbed. Instead, what the scriptures call us to, both in, if you sort of take Corinthians on one side and the promise of God speaking through us in times of persecution, which is what the gospel reading is all about, and put them together, it, under, it calls out of us, in fact, a kind of servanthood that is unafraid to speak the truth, but that's because you care about people so deeply. It has absolutely nothing to do with my right to say whatever I'm supposed to say wherever it is. That's not, we're not, we as Christians are not about rights. When you get into rights, you already are wrong, as it were. 
But instead, it's a call to a level of sacrificial servanthood that I'm willing to take the risk of being rejected, the risk of losing my status, the risk of having my reputation tarnished, the risk of being gossiped about and criticized because I care about you so deeply. I love you. I have to speak the truth in love to you. See, that's very different. And so we're not holding up John and using him as an example for brashness or for being a kind of Christian version of you know, Auntie Mame, um, or any of the sort of female characters that are like that in literature. Instead, we're actually calling for boldness inspired by the Spirit of God that is in fact the fruit of compassion. Boldness that is the fruit of compassion is, I believe, what Jesus is talking about and what he, he, he certainly exemplifies. It's that compassion that causes us to move beyond what some people might consider appropriate tact. Because we care so deeply. Because we care so deeply. Not so much because I need to say it, as it is somebody has to say it. Because the truth must be spoken. Otherwise, I'm accountable for your ignorance. See, that's different, isn't it? And so when we think about John Chrysostom and the boldness that, in essence, you know, the Empress got a lot more than she bargained for, I would really hope for Christians who, in essence, were more than other people bargained for, not because they stand out for just saying whatever they think, but they're known for speaking the truth in love in a way that actually creates disciples for Christians.